Hi, peeps. Um, I'm done with the episode of Genesis Apologetics that I was doing, so I'm going to move on from Biddle and do Eric Hovind, who runs Creation Today. In case you don't know, he's the son of Kent Hovind. Yes, that Kent Hovind, the one who swears he isn't a fraud, but spent 10 to 15 years in prison because he defrauded the IRS, and then he went back to jail for beating his wife. Yeah, charming, huh? Anyway, I'm going to take it a bit easier on Eric, because, I mean, really, this guy never really had a chance, although he should have learned by now, you know? But, uh, yeah, he went to Pensacola Christian Academy for his entire life. Other than that, he has no other credentials, if you can call that a credential. Anyway, um, he did try going to Jackson Hole Bible College, which isn't even a real college, but that's neither here nor there, and he couldn't even do that. So, I don't want to air the Hovind's dirty laundry, but it ties into who he is. When Kent went to prison to serve out his sentence for dodging the IRS, he put his creationism ministry in Eric's name, and Eric never gave it back. Well, you know what, Kent? Karma's a bitch, ain't she? Maybe if he'd been nicer to the kid, he would have given you back your ministry, but you beat the living daylights out of that kid when he was younger. What did you think was going to happen, you loser? And while you're thinking about it, if you're new, why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you've already subscribed to me, make sure you're still subscribed. Because for some reason, YouTube loves to unsubscribe people. Also, if you're new here, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for giving me a chance. And for my fans and subscribers, thank you so much for coming back. You are the lifeblood of this channel. And now, with that, let's get on with the video. The, the, the Bible is our best evidence today that Jesus rose from the dead and the other things that we know about Jesus or anything else the Bible speaks on because it's the infallible, inerrant word of God. Um, but even if somebody doesn't believe the Bible, at least treat it in a way similar to what you would other ancient manuscripts or ancient documents. Okay, so let's start out with the Bible is the infallible word of God. No, it's not. Not even close. Objectively, no, that is not true. It is neither scientifically nor historically accurate period it's a fact you see what you're doing is putting on the bible something you want to be true because you so desperately don't want to be wrong i've got a question for you what is so wrong about being wrong hmm timmy Mind if I call you Timmy? I'm going to call you Timmy because you're acting like a child. Let me tell you something, Timmy. If you do not open yourself to the possibility of being wrong, you will never grow. So your argument is that people who don't believe the Bible are not treating the Bible like other historical documents. I got news for you, Timmy boy. Most of us do treat the Bible as other historical documents. But you know what other historical documents have that the Bible doesn't? Physical 
evidence. Because what, what we see is, even though it has shown itself time and time and time again to be more reliable than those, what the skeptics will do is discount it so much to where they don't believe anything in it, or they'll believe very few things in it, um, and yet they'll be willing to believe something that is far less attested in the historical record. Yes, people won't believe the Bible. I don't know why you're surprised at that. Why don't you put on your big boy pants and deal with it? Because anything in the Bible that's true can be found elsewhere. And anything that can't be found elsewhere is untrue. Actually, let me revise that statement just a little. Just because it's in the Bible and we haven't found physical evidence of it doesn't mean it's untrue. It just means we haven't found physical evidence for it. And if and until we find the physical evidence, it will remain to be assumed that it is untrue. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't make it true. Muslims say the thing about same thing about the Quran. Does that make the Quran true? And yet again, I find myself having to point out that we do not disbelieve the Bible because it's the Bible. Any written document is not proof unless there's proof to back it up. Shown itself to be more reliable than most? Citation fucking needed, bastard. No, the Bible has not proven itself to be more than reliable than most because the moon isn't a light source and the earth isn't flat. I could go on like pointing out that your book indirectly says that pi equals three, which is mind boggling, mind bogglingly stupid. And I could go on and on and on, but I won't. Um, I'll jump to that, even though you might have one witness from, or not even a witness, but one record from 300 years later. Or something. But here you got dozens of eyewitnesses or multiple eyewitnesses who are in that very generation and they've proven to be reliable. And they're like, nah, I don't want anything to do with that. Wow. Multiple eyewitnesses of that generation. Well, if you ever needed a clue that Timmy Boy has no idea what the fuck he's talking about, this is it. Because there are no eyewitnesses. The earliest person who could be an eyewitness was the Apostle Paul. And he is very clear that he never saw Jesus in the flesh. He makes that clear. It was a spiritual vision. The earliest gospel was the Gospel of Mark, and it was written in Rome around 55 CE. Now, um, it could have been written as late as 56 CE or as early as 54 CE, but we're pretty sure on those dates. As for Matthew and Luke, they pretty much rip off of Mark. Um, some of it is not Mark. Some of it's from what's called the Q source. And some of it is from another source. Now, I'm sure if you put your thinking cap on and rack your brain really, really hard, you can find a reason that these two yuckers try to hide that information from you. Hmm, just think about it. And just for sake of completeness, Luke was written around 60 CE, Matthew was written around 70 CE, and John is the most contested and it is widely assumed it was not written until after 100 CE. However, I'm not going to be dishonest with you like these dipshits. So I will tell you that scholars 
range, the Gospel of John is written anywhere from 50 CE to 150 CE. As I said, it has quite a bit of date range and therefore it is uncertain as to when it was written. Which kind of makes you wonder why people, and yes it was people, who decided on the canon, decided to include the Gospel of John in the Greek New Testament because it is contested. So why? And my final point on this dipshittery nonsense is to point out that the Gospels were anonymously written. They were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. So even if you don't believe, like we do, inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God, treat, look at it as you would maybe some other history and see how it lines up, because they're still all pointing to the same thing, Jesus rose from the dead. No, Timmy, you don't believe that book is the inspired, infallible Word of God. You know how I know that? Because I used to be you. No, not a sleazy apologist, but a white you see. And, um, I know that you pick and choose what you want to do and what you want to believe. You see, Timmy boy, and I know this is going to be really hard for you to understand, so pay really close attention to this, okay? Your actions speak volumes over your words, and your actions say that you do not believe that book. You know, such as Hosea 6.6, 6, for I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. You seem to thrive on hatred of the other and not have mercy. Or how about in Matthew, where Jesus says, If you bring your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has something against you, go make a right with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. You don't do that either. And these aren't just the only verses that conveniently slip your mind whenever it's yeah, inconvenient for you to remember these verses. Oh, no, no, no. There are a lot more, but I can't get into those because we would be here all day with just that. Uh, alleged contradiction, like oh, this number in 1 Samuel doesn't match this number in First Chronicles, therefore I can't believe Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. It's like, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> If anything, you've shown that the copy you're holding in your hand, somewhere along the way, there was a typo. <laughs> How does that discount that Jesus died and, and rose? And that's what they'll try to do. So, so yeah, let's jump into then those extra biblical uh, evidences. And grab your pen, guys. Grab your paper. This is going to make a great conversation around the table when you have your family over uh, for Easter uh, on Sunday. Too many people think that it's a battle of sorting out different evidences. Yeah, those people are dumb. I would never say that. Reason being, I don't try to count on countable nouns. So yeah, let's jump into then those extra biblical uh, evidences. And grab your pen, guys. Grab your paper. This is going to make a great conversation around the table when you have your family over uh, for Easter uh, on Sunday, okay? Yeah, so this first one that I'm going to talk about is, is it's subjective, and I recognize that it's subjective. Um, but anybody who has been walking with the Lord for any length of time, uh, especially those who have had a drastic conversion, you know, from going one way. First of all, it's evidence not evidences i have no idea why it is so hard for creationists to wrap their heads around the fact that you don't have to pluralize uncountable nouns really you are a dumb fuck and i'm glad that you recognize that testimony is just subjective bullshit but at the same time you don't seem 
to understand that subjective bullshit is not evidence. Never has been, never will be. And there are plenty of people like me who, quote unquote, felt God in their lives and have left the Christian faith. So you got to do better than that, dude. Come on. I know you have better than this. Being exceedingly sinful and turning around and striving to live a godly life. They know that Christ has made changes in their life. They know that he's alive. They know that um, he has risen because he is living inside them. He, he is within us. Uh, yeah, dude. Um, you know, that thought used to bring me comfort when I was a Christian. But now looking back on it as an atheist, I'm like, that is really creepy. Some dead dude is supposedly in your heart. Another one that we've got that is pretty interesting, it made the news about two years ago right now, was called the Nazareth Inscription. Hmm. And Okay, maybe I'm a little insensitive to insert a sex joke in here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Does anyone else think that that mmm from Eric sounds an awful lot like an orgasmic mmm? Just a thought. So the Nazareth inscription is this marble tablet, and it was presumably found in Nazareth. Nazareth, when um, I think I think it was in the London Museum for a while now. I think it's now it's in Paris. At the, I think it's at the Louvre. Um, but in um, when it was discovered in uh, Paris, there was a note that said um, sent from Nazareth. Now we don't know. I mean, that was back in the eighteen seventies. I think um, we don't know one hundred percent if that's really where it was from. So before I get into what the Nazareth inscription is, I want to point out that even he, and bravo to me, even he admits that we don't know the provenance of this Nazareth inscription. But before I get into the meat of the matter, I just want to point out that um, Later studies have found that it is not a response to the myth of Jesus' resurrection. But, you know, the creationists, they don't care about later studies. They latch on to whatever they want to latch on to and say, this is proof and we're not going to change our minds. Of course, we already knew that. And that is that. In a nutshell, the Nazareth inscription has nothing to do with Jesus. I know, shocker. Instead, it says that Caesar will severely punish those who are caught grave robbing. Um, what does this have to do with Jesus' resurrection? Since I'm an anthropology minor, of which archaeology is a subgenre, and I took most of my classes in ar archaeology. Um, most of my um, viewers are going to know where I'm going with this. He notes that they don't know the provenance, which is a problem. First of all, it was found in 1878 by a collector, not an anthropologist archaeologist or an archaeologist although at this time archaeology wasn't really a thing so anyway um there's no proof of where it came from or who found it or even how it ended up in the louvre the only thing we do know is that there was a note from William Froner, the collector, that said it was found in Nazareth. Pretty sus, if you ask me. Based on lettering style and content, researchers hypothesize that it was written sometime between the late 1st century BCE and the 1st century CE, which doesn't really do much for their cause. Now, the um, note 
that it came from Nazareth is wrong. Isotopic analysis shows that it came from the island of Kos, K-O-S. Um, and he does say that. But just because Timmy says that there was trade between King Herod and Kos at this time does not mean that there was. Um, and furthermore, why is this even a thing? This isn't evidence. One alternative hypothesis is that this um, inscription is the result of an unpopular official who died um, in Greece, um, Nicholas, and people dug him up. Excuse me, his name was Nicias. I'm sorry, I really have bad eyes. And he wasn't buried. He was in a tomb and he died in the 30s BCE, which is before Jesus was even thought of. And they don't address this. So we have one unpopular uh, politician who died, whose tomb was raided. We know this. And the inscription comes from that island. It sure sounds like they're trying to put a square peg in a round hole. But that's okay, because it doesn't matter so much where it's from. And this is what that, that study two years ago kind of was going after. They're like, well, we can't really know that it's from Nazareth because um, because of that. There, there wasn't strict record keeping at that time. You know, that they, they, they weren't really concerned about the provenance of something where it came from. And so what they did is they did some testing. Uh, they were able to get a little sample. They got permission to scrape off a little bit of marble on the back side of this tablet. Are you fucking kidding me? So Timmy, let me ask you something. Are you really this clueless? I don't think you are, but then again, you are a creationist, but you are an apologist and apologists are good liars. So, you know, who knows? At any rate, how do you even get to that conclusion? And get it tested to figure out where it's from because each uh, because the chemical composition of marble is different from different quarries and so they were able to figure out that this tablet came from a little island off the like 110 square mile island off the coast southwestern coast of turkey modern day turkey uh, called kos or kos a kos and um or sometimes written cos nobody cares nobody and you need to shut up and that's where the marble tablet is from. Now, that doesn't mean that's where it was discovered. That doesn't mean that's where it ended up. Because we find marble in Israel. Eric, you've been to Israel. Have you, did yeah. you see marble anywhere? Yeah, there's marble all over. Okay, well, it didn't come from Israel. It came from outside of Israel because oh. they import all of the marble. And so if you find a marble tablet in Israel, it's not shocking at all that it was from somewhere else. And did Israel have any economic relations with the island of Kos? Well, yes, they did. In fact, we find inscriptions talking about King Herod on the island of Kos. They wow. Oh, my God! So, you didn't really make an argument here, so I'm going to have to guess, and my guess is this, because you think that King Herod had some trading with the island of Kos, this means Jesus rose from the dead? Aside from the fact that making up a story willy-nilly is not science you haven't even addressed any other alternate hypotheses including the hypothesis that caesar made this for cost i'm gonna break it down for you timmy because you don't seem to understand what you have done is take one piece of evidence take something a storybook said and from that one piece of evidence, A, go all the way to conclusion Z. And hey, I'm even being generous here. Because I don't think you thought this through. I just think that 
you're full of bullshit, you know your audience is gonna buy your bullshit, and you really don't care one way or another whether this makes sense or not. Well, friends, I expected this to be my last video on the subject, but these people just get so much fucking wrong in this 39-minute video that I have to make another one. So there will be one more response video to this video, and then we'll go on to something else. Maybe back to the flood, who knows. Um, at any rate, I had fun with this because, you know, theology is kind of my wheelhouse and I love to make fun of these god-awful people who think they've got all of their shit together when, you know, they really don't. And you may say that I'm a bad person for that, but you know what? If these people really want to believe this shit, they deserve being made fun of. At any rate, that's all for today. Make sure you hit the like button. Please leave comments down below. It helps the algorithm. And if you are financially able, please become a member of this channel for as low as 99 cents a month. It really helps me out. And until next time, folks, see you later. Bye.